This is part two of the program development walkthrough. Now we saw the source code in part one, so now we'll look at the Plasm assembler for converting it into machine code. It's available for three different platforms and operating systems, MS Windows, Linux and Mac OS. Now I'm not too familiar with the latter, but I believe the instructions for Linux are very similar. The assembler is a command line tool, so it runs within a command window. If you invoke it with no parameters, it will show the options available. Now before trying this, check the website to make sure you're using the latest version. The differences between the platforms are mainly how you start a command window and how you enter commands at the command prompt. To run the assembler on Windows, you just enter the executable name, Plasm. On Linux, I'm using Lubuntu here, and Mac OS possibly, you enter a dot slash followed by the executable name. Plasm assumes your source code file has a dot pls filename extension, so rename it if you've not already done so. I'll call it trig.pls. And it's also a lot easier if it lives in the same folder as the Plasm executable. There are quite a few parameter options, but for a basic check to see if your source code is syntactically correct, just enter the source code file name as the first parameter. So on Windows you'd enter plasm space trig, and on the others you'd enter dot slash plasm space trig. You don't need to type the dot pls extension. Now this would create a listing file called trig.pll, which shows the machine code for each source code statement. And what you do next depends on how you want to run it. Now at the moment the machine code is just a list of hex values in the listing file and you can load this by hand using the switches either into the simulator or the real machine but if it's a large program or you want a quicker way you've got two choices. For the real machine the code has to be written onto media for one of the three peripherals paper tape, mag tape or disc. There's no backdoor method and this is intentional for authenticity. For the simulator you can do the same, but this time there is a backdoor method which was used for testing the prototype but has been left in. This loads the machine code directly to memory, bypassing the peripherals. I'll look at this method first as it's the easiest. If you want to use the real machine, skip this and go to the next video. The backdoor command is T for test load, and this causes the simulator to look for a special file with a .plh extension which contains just a list of hex values. It's a plain text file, so you can create it or edit it by hand with a text editor, but the assembler will create one automatically from your source code if you specify the dash "-h", option. So how do you tell the simulator which .plh file to load? Well, there are no Windows-like features, such as drop-down menus, so the file has to be identified another way. Again, this was intentional. It allows the code for both the simulator and the real machine to be as identical as possible, so they would automatically remain in step with each other during development. And I also wanted to retain the old school look and feel. So even though it's running on a modern PC, I did not want to introduce unrealistic special controls which weren't on the real machine. So the existing load switches are used to identify the file. You set up a four-digit hex number on the left-hand group, and when you press T, it will search the current folder for a .plh file whose file name contains those four digits. You can still provide descriptive text in the file name, as long as those four digits are present somewhere. Now I use a couple of conventions to ensure all these files are sorted in a useful way. Here's the name I use for this trig program. The single prefix number represents the emulation, 1, 2 or 3, for toy A, toy B or Plex, so files will be sorted in emulation order. I also place the four hex digits, 3038 in this case, after the description, so they are sorted in description order within each emulation group. If you put the four digits before the description, the files will be sorted in numerical order, which is OK for finding the next unused number for a new program, but no good for finding a specific program from its description. Anyway, I'll rename trig.pls to use this convention, 
Then run the assembler again with the dash H option to create a .plh file with this new name. Right, we can now run the plasma sim simulator and as with the assembler, make sure you're using the latest version. So open a new command window, navigate to the required folder if not already there and on Windows enter plasma sim and on the others enter dot slash plasma sim. Now if you've never run the simulator before, you may see a garbled screen like this. But don't panic, it's just because your platform's default command window size needs adjusting. Now full instructions are in the simulator guide document for all three platforms, but basically you just need to stretch or shrink the window by dragging the sides or corners, each time pressing Shift and W in order to force the simulator to redraw the window contents. I keep repeating this until you see a complete rectangular box shape along the bottom. Now this Shift and W redraw option is only available at startup. The screen will not be redrawn after a microcode is loaded, so it's important to get the size correct before proceeding. Now this new window size may need to be saved as the default if you want, but this depends on your operating system. On Lubuntu Linux, the window size seems to be remembered automatically, so if you restart the simulator, the correct size appears each time. But it's not difficult to readjust if you need to. OK, now go through the Plasma startup sequence for loading the Plex microcode. Now the non-mouse interface may appear clunky, but it's just a series of key presses which soon become muscle memory. Now this is all in the user guide, but I'll show them again here. They're all in lowercase unless otherwise stated. M, 3, Z, R, wait for the halt light, Shift and M, and Z. There's six keystrokes in total. Now set the four digit file number on the left hand load switches. The keyboard focus, those square brackets, should already be at the correct position. So just press keys 3, 0, 3, 8. Then press T to load the file. You should see a confirmation message with the full file name. So press one of the keys shown to acknowledge the prompt. I always use Y to clear the opera. There's no need to do it at startup, but I do it regardless as there may be something on the screen from the previous run. There's no other way of clearing the opera screen unless your program does it. The reset command Z mimics the RST or reset switch on the real machine, so it just resets the CPU and not the peripherals. So press Z again to reset all CPU registers. And as before, this is not needed first time round, but useful for subsequent runs. Then Shift and Z to set PC to the start of RAM, which in Plex's case is hex 10. On the toy emulations, you wouldn't need to do this because the start of RAM is the same as PC0. Press R to run the program. And if all goes well, you'll see the opening text shown in part one, and the program will loop waiting for a keypad button to be pressed. Out of interest, you could pause it here and look at some registers. Press Q to stop. PC should confirm the program is in the keypad wait loop, and you can check the address with the listing file. You can single step using S to watch it cycle round. Then press R to continue running. Now to simulate pressing buttons on the keypad, Press the up arrow key to move the keyboard focus to the keypad. The focus wraps round so you could press the down arrow three times instead. Press A and you should see a single cycle of a sine wave. Press B and you should see a cosine. Contain your amazement and press Q to stop. Now if you've done any programming before, you'll be familiar with the repetitive cycle of edit the source, assemble or compile, run, error, back to edit, and so on. And even though we're using what might be seen as antiquated command windows with no mouse or touchpad control, the single key interface is surprisingly easy to drive. If you arrange your windows so the source code editor, the assembler, and simulator are all running in separate windows, you can easily flip between them. 
You can either click a window to bring it into focus or use the keyboard shortcuts to cycle through them one by one. On MS Windows and Linux, Alt and Tab does this. Here's an example of an edit test cycle. Let's change the degree limit from 360 to 180. Assuming your text editor is the same as mine, press Ctrl and S to save the changes. Change focus to the assembler window and press up arrow and enter. Now this repeats the previous command, so the source will be reassembled and a new .plh file created. Change focus to the simulator window and press T to reload the new machine code, Y to acknowledge and clear the OPER, Z to reset all registers. Now this is optional as it depends whether your program expects all registers to be initialized. I tend to do it from habit. Then Shift and Z to reset PC to start of RAM, and this is essential. And finally press R to run, and that's it. After a while you can do all this without thinking. The simulator keyboard focus should still be on the keypad, so you can now press A or B to see if your edit worked. OK, that's the backdoor load method for the simulator. You can also load via the peripherals, just like the real machine. And there are simulator commands to mimic the load and unload switches from the machine. Now this will be covered in the next video, but I'll just mention that using this method on the simulator restricts you to fixed file names for the media contents. There's no luxury of choosing files with the switches because that doesn't exist on the real machine. So each of the six peripherals has a corresponding fixed file name which simulates the media on an SD card. These file names are all uppercase, starting with the word plasma and with a file extension according to the peripheral. PTR for the paper tape reader, PTP for the punch, MT0 and MT1 for the mag tapes, and ED0 and ED1 for the discs. And this means if you want to load different programs via the tape reader, say, you have to overwrite the PTR file each time. Right, that's it. The final video of this mini-series will show the process for the real machine. See you there.